Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take them just a sec. There we go. Got my mic on. Thank you very much, folks. Um, Todd Gordon did a fabulous job setting the table and giving you guys some great insights into technical analysis. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, spend some time with Todd, as you could see from the pictures he posted uh, of us skiing. I, I have skied every weekend all year except this one. Um, and that's because Kim Gifler asked me if I'd come here to the Traders Expo. And as Todd said about friends and so forth when you were all waving, um, Kim was defining for me. I said, sure, Kim, I'll be there because we're friends. And she said, no, John, you're my good friend. And I said, what's the difference between friends and good friends? She said, a friend will help you move a couch. A good friend will help you move a body. <laughs> and Kim hasn't asked me to move many bodies lately, but I know that's out there somewhere, Kim. Um, I am John Nigerian. I'm lucky enough to be here in front of you guys. Uh, I'll be signing a bunch of books that we're giving away. I know whenever you see that commercial, you think, are they really giving those books away? Yeah, we are. Uh, and for uh, probably the first 400 of you that will be down there at 6.30 tonight, I'll sign as soon as the exhibit hall opens at 6, I think. So at 6.30, I'll be down there signing books for an hour, giving them away. You won't pay a penny for the book. We'll give it away. It's called Follow the Smart Money. It details how Pete and I do what we do. Um, and as uh, the nice intro was uh, that I played for the Bears, very briefly, I played four games. Um, my brother Pete, so not for long, was very true of me. Um, but I did get onto the stage, got to break a helmet in half, uh, which is fun, and that's why probably they figured out Mike Singletary was better than me, because Mike probably broke a dozen of them. Um, and that's what, one of the things he was famous for, by the way. But he's also a great guy. My brother Pete, another great guy, um, played six years in the NFL. So whenever you see me and Pete together on CNBC, a lot of folks will say, John, are you and Pete twins? And I'll say, no, we're six years apart. And then a bunch of them will say, well, Pete's the older one, right? And I said, yep, that's right. No, it's not. I'm the older one. And I'm just very lucky to have a brother as smart and as nice as Pete to work with me. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of these slides, but this one, uh, again, we will give you that book downstairs. So uh, the first 400 of you at 630, I'll sign them today and again tomorrow. For those of you who are here tomorrow, we'll also give, give those books away. And you can uh, check it out if you go to Investitute. Um, that's also uh, another place you can get it if you don't want to wait in line today or tomorrow. Um, I did do uh, a lot of work with CNBC for 10 years before that. I was with Fox. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been with CNBC. Uh, they do a great job supporting us. Um, hopefully, we'll get them at some of these conferences in the future. But if they could see what a nice crowd that Kim and the group at Traders Expo have put together, I'm sure they'd love to uh, be up here in front of you as well. Um, the talk today was really and is really going to be about, OK, what's a bigger driver, China or Jerome Powell and the Fed? Um, and I'll discuss various points about it. Um, and then I'll offer you some insights uh, that I believe I have. Um, as you can see with the uh, picture here on the slides, uh, China has been beaten up. Um, there's no doubt about that. If you doubt that, um, and I, when, when we had Mark Mobius, Mark's not here at this one, is he? No. When we had Mark Mobius down in uh, Orlando earlier this year, Mark, uh, we were talking about China and so forth, and one of the things I believe about China that you may have heard me say on CNBC um, is that be careful about wanting to be the president for life because I'd rather have four years than a lifetime appointment in China if the market drops 27% in a year, which it did last year. Why? Because when the markets drop 27% and people in China are seeing factories closing and people that have gotten used to different types of protein um, are no longer able to afford those proteins and so forth, you might see that your lifespan gets shortened by a lot. So if you don't think Xi Jinping pays attention to that, I think 
that you probably also don't think that President Trump watches Fox and Friends. Um, <laughs> he does, and Xi Jinping does. They both pay attention to things like this. And I think that it would be a mistake to think that, oh, China's got a 100-year plan. Ask Japan about the 100-year plan with uh, Pebble Beach. Anybody here remember that, show of hands? OK, when they bought Pebble Beach and paid $790 million, the Japanese did, I believe a Japanese insurance company, they were overpaid for it, at least at that time. And they said, but we have a 100-year plan for it. And two years later, they sold it at a significant loss. So 100-year plans tend to change, and lifetime appointments, like Xi Jinping is operating under right now, tend to change as well. So be careful about that. Um, they do have a good relationship, um, and I'll, I'm going to touch on that. But nonetheless, they're both pretty tough old birds, and they also need to really appeal to the bases that they have. Xi Jinping's base is Communist Party in China. Um, President Trump's, of course, uh, has uh, been detailed in the press over and over again, uh, so I don't need to extend that. Um, here are some of the companies in the United States with the largest exposure to China. I'm not saying you buy all these. I'm not saying for any of my slides you go out and buy any of this. Um, but I am not a registered person. I own a, uh, a wealth management firm. I own a firm that teaches people how to trade and so forth. But I am not out here saying I know exactly what your situation is. You should buy every one of these stocks. These are the stocks in the tech space that when I looked at it, uh, I think some of you would be perhaps surprised to see Skyworks is 85% of their exposure comes from China. NVIDIA, Micron, Apple. Um, obviously, people thought that one of the reasons that Apple didn't do so well uh, was really twofold. It wasn't just uh, that people in China cut back and maybe rolled over to a cheaper version of the iPhone because the new version uh, the 10X and the 10XR were so much more expensive, but also because a lot of the folks uh, in China were looking at uh, the best opportunity for their money, and few of them could actually afford the new Apple product. But I think the Apple uh, wounds were also self-inflicted because Apple decided to stop giving us guidance and telling us how many actual units were sold when that's what everybody on the street was using as a yardstick, as a metric. So if you are expecting to see 48 million phones sold and all of a sudden Apple tells you, we're not going to tell you how many phones we're selling, you're not going to be a happy camper. And you saw what happened to the market reaction as that played out. Here's the Chinese companies that if we get to a trade deal, these are the ones whenever I hear whispers about a deal coming closer, and I don't think anybody in this room thinks the deal's going to be like a light switch on and off. And it'll take a long time for us to hear what the deal is, um, what the various uh, uh, alternatives will be if uh, agreements aren't met, if things that are agreed to are not uh, actually adhered to by the Chinese, what will happen? Well. When I'm trading these stocks, these are the ones that are going to move dramatically, I believe. Chinese travel company, C-Trip. This one has had 8 and 10 and 20% moves um, in a single day on whispers. So have um, HUYA, which is a live gaming platform, and YY, which is streaming business in China. These are companies that are going to do extraordinarily well, I believe, if a trade deal comes to fruition. Now, we could, everybody wonders, why don't you talk about Caterpillar? Why don't you talk about GM? Because, of course, tariffs and cars and so forth, those aren't as exciting to me. And quite frankly, I don't think they're going to move like these. So my way of playing uh, as far as what's bigger, uh, Jerome Powell or a trade deal with China, these would be some of the ways that I would play a trade deal with China happening. However, Jerome Powell is a bigger deal, short term, than a trade deal with China. Why am I saying that? Just look at what happened as soon as he did his pivot in January. Why do you think that from December 24th low, 
we saw that massive surge uh, in money flowing in. Were we oversold? I believe so. I think, Todd, you thought so. Um, but Jerome Powell also scared a lot of people when in October, October 3rd, when he said, we're pretty darn far from neutral with our rate. Me, and people took that as meaning since the Fed had three more, at least uh, according to the dot plots, three more rate hikes out there, uh, people got really upset. And when people get scared and upset, they leave the markets. And they left in droves in October, came back a little into November, and then December was just a crap show. And part of that crap show was, uh, again, self-inflicted wounds, in one case at least, it was Steve Mnuchin going out and talking to a bunch of the bankers and then telling us that he spoke to a bunch of the bankers. Nobody wanted to hear that. Um, I remember when uh, Paulson, former Treasury Secretary, spoke to a bunch of the bankers in the crash of 08. We didn't know about that on that next day, but Mnuchin basically decided to go out and tell everybody that he had spoken to all the bankers and they were fine. And some of us were scratching our heads going, you're the Treasury Secretary. Don't you kind of know what their balance sheets look like? Why do you got to bring them all into a room and ask them if it's OK? You know if they're in trouble or not, because all of it rests with you. You see it every day. But anyway, that scared the markets pretty severely. And that's why on December 24th, half a day trading, we fell, whatever, six or 800 points, because the markets don't like to hear that sort of uh, transparency. Here's what happened last year. Um, on a given day, believe it or not, we fell 1,600 points in the Dow. And we went from down 700 to down 1,600 in about four and a half minutes. And whenever these things have happened, like the flash crash, for instance, which was 2011, when that happens, the numbers that you and I are seeing aren't real because they've already happened and we're seeing them late because the tape can't keep up with it. And that was the case with this. People thought that basically the tape, meaning you know the ticker, stopped moving uh, because it just got jammed up with so much data. And all of a sudden, we went from down 1,600, as you can kind of see on the, uh, uh, that V-shaped bottom right there. There we go, right here. You can see how quickly we came off. Uh, it was a matter of minutes maybe even seconds at the bottom before we came back up. And I bring that up because during December, we were seeing more volatility in the S&P 500 than Bitcoin. I mean, how crazy is that? And you guys know what happened to Bitcoin last year because it went from basically touching 20,000 in December of last year to now where it is $3,500, $3,800, wherever it is these days. So volatility isn't always a bad thing, especially the way that I view it, and I think the way a lot of you view it. I'm going to have a chart that I'll put up here in a second about the way Goldman Sachs views it. But volatility just means that premiums are higher. If you're somebody like me who likes to buy and sell premiums, I like higher premiums. It makes it more fun to trade, um, and it provides more opportunities. This is a chart of the VIX, as you can see, hitting that spike December 24th right here and touching all the way up to basically almost uh, 36 or 40 on a given print right there before it bled all the way back off. Um, I don't know that it goes to single digits again, but I think that spike created a lot of opportunities. Here's an example of how that volatility works for you. I had the privilege of speaking at Davos this year. Um, and a three-night stay at this hotel in Davos was 7,500 euros for three nights. And they have a special deal in Switzerland where you can only mark it up 20% higher than your highest price. Uh, but apparently that deal doesn't apply during Davos. So um, the very next, uh, whoops, sorry, the very next uh, period, that same three-day stay would have been 237 euros, 97% less. So if you're somebody who has um, calls, for instance, to sell in Apple, 
when all of a sudden the world doesn't know what's going on and is Tim Cook crazy or are they ever going to sell another iPhone in China or whatever? Bunch of stupid questions because Tim Cook's a genius and Apple's just fine, by the way. Um, I think you'd rather take advantage of that and collect that higher premium than collecting $237. Just one example, but uh, an example that's kind of one that all of us could uh, understand. Todd, before I got up here, Todd Gordon was talking about EEM, and I saw a great presentation by him out at the chart summit that he and I were at in Breckenridge, Colorado, two weeks ago. Uh, we went cat skiing, it was fabulous. Bunch of great uh, smart traders like JC Peretz and uh, Brian Shannon, they were the guys that hosted it, and Todd and I got to participate, loved it. Take a look at the United States over the last five years versus EEM. As Todd showed you, EEM did have a significant outperformance in a very narrow period of time, but over a five year period, the US is up 45% and EEM is up three. A lot of what's gonna happen uh, in EEM, of course, is gonna be what happens in Asia. And when you guys look at it, um, I'm sure that Todd has told you as well, don't think that you're getting Brazil as a significant piece and so forth. A lot of what you're getting when you get EEM is Asia, and most of that isn't China. Most of that is Korea um, and the semiconductor plays. So the United States and China are discussing a meeting where President Trump and Xi Jinping are likely to meet down at mar lago play some golf, have a good time, come out for a press conference, and so forth. Um, would I buy it that day? For a short trade, yeah, for a short, very short period of time, just like Monday this past week, um, I think a lot of you probably saw a spike to the upside on news that perhaps an agreement was imminent, and then we sold off hard after that. In fact, I talked on CNBC about somebody coming in and buying 100,000 puts on uh, calls, 100,000 calls in the VIX, which is like buying a bunch of puts on the S&P because calls in the VIX go higher when the market dives. And they bought these calls, they bought 100,000 calls, they sold, I think, 30,000 put spreads to pay for it. Bottom line was, on that trade in about 20 minutes, they made $1.3 million. Um, and they still have the trade on. And they probably will ride this trade for a little bit longer, uh, but that's somebody that was pretty smart that had a lot of money to put to work. Um, China has committed to buying up to 1.2 trillion in our goods. These are why the US, uh, reasons to be optimistic about the US on this trade agreement. Uh, they remain far apart on forced transfer of intellectual property and so forth. That'll be a big sticking point, especially with Congress. And this is why he's worried beyond what I already said about uh, you know, be careful about having a lifetime appointment. They had their worst year in a long time, Chinese stocks did. They were down 27% last year. You can imagine the whining that would have gone on here if our market was down 27%. In December, we wiped out all the little bit of the gains that we had and went negative, but in China, 27% means, like I say, factory closures, and a lot of people having to change their lifestyle, some of them pretty dramatically. Um, this fall was almost double the fall of their closest rival, Japan, which was down 14%. Um, reasons for the slump included the trade war, which is you know 90% of it. Uh, here's property sales, however, in China. As you can see, pretty dramatic sell-off in property sales in China. Uh, from January of uh, 2016 right here when, it, when we peaked to coming all the way back down. Not going negative like we were in that period, but all the way down to there. And China announced that they're going to throw up to $125 billion and they did a tax cut. I mean, they're basically throwing the kitchen sink at it. And I think the next piece that they're going to throw at it is a deal that we're going to have between ourselves and China but it will take a while to play out. Um, but again, to the question that I asked myself when Kim asked me to speak, 
which is bigger, Jerome Powell or a, a deal with China? Long term, deal with China, of course. Short term, Jerome Powell. If Jerome Powell um, makes a dramatic shift as they did that pivot in January and you don't pay attention to it, you're making a big mistake because this is something that's behind why the, we had our best January in 30 years here in this company. Dovish, Fed, bullish. You heard Warren Buffett say it, that if, he, if, if interest rates, uh, if the 30-year rate um, is going to be hovering around this 3% level, he said, I'll buy stocks all day. Um, only problem is he's got so much money that it's tough for him to buy enough stocks. He needs to do such big transformative deals that every once in a while he gets sucked in with people like that Heinz deal where when they bought Heinz, they thought, oh, this is so great. But Heinz wasn't a brand that was you know, on everybody's uh, radar as far as, oh, this is the brand in the United States. Uh, Tide might be a little closer to that with Procter & Gamble than uh, Heinz was. And now with all these grocery stores continuing to produce their own, uh, that's one of the problems that Buffett has with that Heinz deal. Trade deal with China is another reason to remain bullish. Fuel prices have fallen, another reason to remain bullish. And U.S. consumer, if you haven't noticed, is still spending pretty actively. Um, some of the numbers that came out this past five days, Target, Kohl's, both of them just blew out their numbers and moved higher. Both of those stocks I still think are cheap. My brother Pete loves both of those, and, and we're long those in a manage money that we do. Here's a, an interesting thing that came out at the end of February, guys. Um, I know you're aware that smart firms like Goldman, I don't demonize Goldman Sachs. I traded for the partners at Goldman Sachs. Pete and I did for, I believe, five or six years, just for their money, not for the money that Goldman manages for outside, just for the partners we traded for them. Um, and I think they're some of the brightest men and women in the business. Um, fundamentals of overwriting the S&P 500. They did a 16-year study. You guys know what an overwrite is. It's where you own the stock and you sell calls against it. So in other words, you own an apartment and you rent it out, either monthly, quarterly, or whatever. That's the same thing. That's what this is about. So Goldman looked at doing covered calls on the S&P 500 stocks, and they said over a 16-year period that the growth of $100 invested in the S&P 100 total return versus selling these 10 and then selling 10% out of the money covered calls on a monthly rebalanced market cap weighted portfolio outperformed by about 140 basis points per year. Um, gave you a little less downside and a lot more uh, uh, cash flow than just collecting the dividends, the one point, whatever it is, 1.3%, 1.7%, wherever it is right now. Um, as I've already told you guys, I'm going to be signing books at 6.30 downstairs. I'm not winding up yet, but I'm just going to show you a couple trades. This one was from last week because it shows you the methodology we use when my brother Pete and I trade. This particular one is Western Digital, WDC. This is what our log looks like where we post these trades for all the, uh, the subscribers. And this is what we cite on the Fast Money Show then virtually every day. So Western Dig, um, here it is. We've been buying calls in there since it was 44.15. And that date was January 25th. Then they came in and bought more calls um, on, in uh, February. Then they bought them again. Then they bought them again. So um, we love following when people are going back to the same well. When the, somebody who's been right decides to stick with that and put more money into that particular trade, here's where that has gone basically from the end of January when we started citing those when it was, let's say, 40 bucks a share up here to 52. So there's few better read-throughs for us I love what Todd Gordon does, and he's one of the best tech analysis guys in the business. Um, I pay attention to what he does. I think if you're somebody who follows charts, you could make a lot of money trading options against the charts when they set up 
for what you're looking for, if it's bullish or if it's bearish, call spreads, put spreads, whatever, I think you can really take advantage of it. Here's EA, uh, Electronic Arts. Um, luckily, beginning of February, we saw a very bearish three-way when the stock was $91 a share. They were buying the 89 puts when the stock was $2, let's call it, higher than that. And what happened after that? Stock fell from basically um, $91 a share, there's the drop to $78 a share. The calls that they were buying, and or rather the puts they were buying for $3 went to $12, um, almost overnight, literally overnight. Um, and then, strangely enough, believe it or not, they came back in and bought calls when the thing fell like that. No better tell than that. The reason we wrote the book, as you guys will see, um, follow the smart money is that we know that there are people out there that can spend more money on research than I can, that have a bigger team to go out and visit all these conferences, JP Morgan Healthcare Conference, uh, the Cowan Cannabis Conference, whatever it might be. They, they have a team of people that are basically texting from the back of the room as the speaker is saying something bullish or bearish about the stock. If you don't think that they have better access to information, than you do because you're only one person, um, then you're kidding yourself. Here's another one, Snapchat. Here's three in a row bullish calls on Snapchat. Beginning first day of January, Snapchat's 569. Somebody comes in and buys 12,500 February 7 calls. So they're about $1.30 out of the money. They bought 1.2 million share equivalent of that. What happened? Snapchat came out and uh, there they bought them all the way up till the 6th when they bought 13,000 February 9s. What did Snapchat do? Eh, it popped basically to nine bucks, pulled back to 839. There's, uh, whoops, sorry. There's a chart of what happened when it made that pop. So somebody. Insider trading? Sometimes. Gentleman said insider trading, and I say sometimes. I know that, uh, for instance, uh, Raj Raj Ratnam, if anybody here remembers that name, um, he was accused of insider trading for a bunch of stocks. One of them was Hilton. We talked about Hilton. I even put it out into the 4th of July holiday, and I said, this looks dirty. Somebody's buying way too many out of the money calls with like two weeks to go. Takeover was announced by Blackstone, um, and the SEC called us and asked us for our data, and we gave it to them. I'm not saying that's what got him, but I'm saying that when people do insider trading, when you have material non-public information, what I described earlier, going to conferences, paying for um, research and so forth, that's not insider trading. Insider trading is where I know, because I've got a girlfriend who's at the uh, law firm that's copying basically the board packs that they're going to circulate at Hilton um, for Blackstone taking them over, that would be insider trading, material non-public information. And when that happens, people get caught and they go to jail. We are following unusual activity. So I'm not creating it. And I don't have that girlfriend, luckily I have a wife, um, uh, who would be very upset if I did have a girlfriend. Um, I'll leave you guys with one quick joke about lying and liars, um, because it's not always what you think. So there was a little boy, came up to his dad, said, Dad, how did I get here? His dad said, what do you mean? And he said, well, how, did I, how was I born? And his dad said, oh, well, your mom and I got together, and there were, our moms and dads were babies once too, and they were uh, brought together um, throughout history, men and women have gotten together and had babies, and that's how you got here. And he said, oh, okay, it's kind of confusing, but okay. So he asked his mom, how did, how did I get here? And his mom said, well, back in the beginning there were monkeys, and then those monkeys started evolving, and they got smarter and smarter, and eventually they started uh, becoming people, and then those people had babies, and that's how you got here. So the kid went to his dad, and he said, dad, I can't believe it, you lied to me. Dad said, what do you mean? And he said, well, mom said we come from monkeys. And he said, that's her side of the family. <laughs>
You guys, thank you very much.